Hi, everyone. My name is Lydia Contos. I'm the executive director of Kaufman Music Center, and you are in our building at this very moment. I'm very excited about tonight because uh, tonight marks the first in a series of collaborations uh, between the New York Times and Kaufman Music Center. Curious, how many of you uh, had heard of Kaufman Music Center before tonight? Not bad. So very briefly, for those of you who haven't been here before, we're actually a home for music, uh, education and performance. Uh, but there's something very special about that. We teach folks of all ages, wonderful programs, great concert hall. We're also very known for cutting edge programming. We do a lot of experimentation, both in learning and in performing. So it's kind of a cool place. If you ever looked at a musical instrument and said, nah, not me, you dust it off and bring it here, and I bet you could even learn it. You're obviously advanced ages. Um, <laughs> obviously, I don't have my glasses on. So, <laughs> so if, you, you, if you'd like to learn more about us, um, uh, you can visit KaufmanMusicCenter.org. Um, I hope you do, and I look forward to seeing you back at future Times Talks. Um, tonight's talk is also really exciting because we get to, to, to welcome two leaders on the cutting edge of innovation in fashion design. So we feel a kind of an innovative sort of uh, sisterhood there. The, the Malivi sisters of Rodarte clothing. Um, they are edgy and different, in fashion, so much like the way we speak to innovation in music. So I really appreciate your coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And now I'd like to welcome Michelle Gray, who's the Director of Programming for the New York Times on the stage. Hope to see you next time. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry for another intro, but good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times Live Conversation Series. Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, and science. Tonight, I'm, wel I'm delighted to welcome you to, uh, sorry, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with visionary fashion designers and first-time filmmakers, Kate and Laura Malivi, co-founders of the CFDA-winning conceptual luxury brand, Rodarte. The duo will discuss their multi-hyphenate careers, creative inspirations, and their upcoming feature film, Woodshock described as a hypnotic exploration of isolation, paranoia, and grief that exists in a dream world all of its own. Kate and Laura have collaborated on special projects with architect Frank Geary and Gustavo Dudamel, Darren Aronofsky on costumes for the film Black Swan, Benjamin Millipierre on costumes for the New York City Ballet and the LA Dance Project, and artists Catherine Opie and Alex Sos. You'll hear much more about tonight's guests from our esteemed and very cool moderator, Linda Yablonski, a contributing writer for the New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Linda Yablonski and Kate and Laura Malivi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda. <laughs> this is Kate, and that's Laura over there. Hi. We so don't lose track. Rodarte. Your name is Malevi. Right. Where did Rodarte come from? Rodarte is our mother's maiden name. Ah. And it's her father immigrated from Mexico in the. You can't hear me? Sorry, what? Try. Loud. Can you hear me? <laughs> is this, you try again. I don't know, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, okay. Well, our grandfather's from Mexico, was from Mexico, and he immigrated to California, and um, Rodarte is a name that we chose for our company because we felt it represented a way to honor our mom's family. And actually, weirdly enough, um, when we were first starting out, we found a little, uh, you know, an old directory. I don't know why it didn't occur to us, because it seems kind of obvious, well, we can just use our mom's maiden name as an option, but we hadn't thought of it. And my dad said, you know, I was at the um, Salvation Army, and I found this old directory in my mom's entire family, who a lot of them moved back to Mexico. 
So at the time, they had, when they were in America, were, were all in this directory, and we kind of knew in that moment, oh, we should take her mom's maiden name for the for, for, for the book. Yeah. Yeah. So Rodarte is your fashion label, and right. from what I gather, it, it's a family business. Yeah. Well, with the two of us, I guess. Yes. <laughs> but does the rest of your family participate in this? Well, when we first Was started, it? Laura and I, um, you know, we really just kind of jumped into it. We didn't know anything about fashion, and the people around us didn't really know anything about fashion either. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so we... That's almost a recipe for success. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is. I think and it worked out okay. we kind of had to get all of our friends and, and our family involved. So, for example, the first show that we did in New York, I remember we really didn't even understand what New York Fashion Week meant or what doing a fashion show no was. No one else does either. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> Except for, you know, what we may have seen on TV. And um, I remember we called all of our friends and we said, can you come and help us get models or can you come and help style? And a lot of the people that came that still work with us today are all, you know, L.A. transplants that come with yeah. us. And at the time, a lot of them weren't even, you know, it wasn't like a very professional setup. It evolved into more of one. Um, but, you know, my mom helped us in early dresses. She made things on the back of certain pieces. Yeah. And, um, you know, my dad helped us, you know, in terms of running the actual company. It's an independent brand. Laura and I are kind of the sole... Uh, part of what we do. So in a way, it's friends and family that became Rodarte. But it's not Rodarte that has made this film that right. we're here to talk about, Woodchuck, right. your first film, yes. which uh, before we get into it, and then we'll talk about how you got to it, could we run the, uh, a, a clip from the film just to set the, so people can f get a sense of the atmosphere and the tone? the clip was going to be longer. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, the film is set partly in a redwood forest, right, yes. which is where you grew up. Not in the forest, but near <laughs> yeah. Well, we practically did. You know, we grew up in uh, a small place called Aptos, right in Santa Cruz. And Laura and I really grew up almost on the edge of an old growth redwood forest. And our father uh, was a mycologist, a mushroom expert. So as you can imagine, we were surrounded by... I know. <laughs> I mean, it's almost difficult to explain. If you think the fashion wor world is interesting and eccentric, let me tell you the mushroom world <laughs> takes it to a new level. <laughs> and we grew up, um, you know, in this amazing kind of imaginary space. We were in uh, these gigantic forests with huge trees, and um, we played... I don't know. We spent most yeah. of our childhood kind of in those we forests. We would walk down, the, like just walk down the road any day after school and just wander into one of the woods. And I don't think we knew it was a special experience until later on. And you realize not everyone had that in the backyard of their house, practically. Um, but where we shot this was seven hours north of that. So the trees that we had were very big, but these are the biggest ones that are in California. So they're... They say about 95% of these trees were cut down. Um, the oldest ones are about two to 3,000 years old. And we really just wanted to tell a story that captured what it was like to, you know, 
be in those woods and what those trees make you feel like as a human, which is a very, um, gives you a lot of perspective. They're, they make you feel so small and they're so magnificent. Enormous. I mean, yeah. I've never been in my, personally, so this was my first real sense of the scale yeah. of these trees. They're 2,000 years old? Yeah, they Why do. is it legal to cut them down? Well, that was something I yeah. think in a way that maybe had a, I, how would you say when something affects you and uh, that you don't understand until later because they, they cut them. A lot of people don't know that logging in California was really one of the biggest industries. I think at one point it was the cutting of redwoods was bigger than the gold rush. And mm -hmm. as you can imagine, these trees um, can get, I think, bigger than the Statue of Liberty. To put it in perspective, they are taller. At least taller. Yeah, taller. Huge. They're the largest living organisms on the planet. So, you know, they were making a lot of things out of these trees, whether it's, you know, picnic tables or homes. Um, anyway, but that, a lot of people, in the, you know, there's huge movements to try to save them. And a lot of the work that was done um, we're lucky enough has resulted in a lot of national and state parks and, and to this day, you know, hopefully if, if this movie or other things inspire you to take a chance to, you know, go and visit these trees, it, it's truly a life altering experience and, um, you know, they need our protect, protection now. We need to be actively involved in making sure that um, they survive, you know. Well, their endangerment is a kind of metaphor in the film, but the film itself is not about Right. The no. forest, no. <laughs> even though it's set right. there, yeah. it is about, it's more like a Midsummer Night's Dream meets Psycho Killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's well, so you're, great. Yeah. That's so well, good. Well, you know what we... It's a, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> well, that sums up everything. We don't have yeah, to the say. Yeah, the woods are a great, a, a very large metaphor for Teresa's internal journey and her mental landscape. So it's a very subjective story. You follow this character and it's a stream of conscious narrative that um, follows, you know, a woman in a state of grief and then, you know, her, her experience of disorientation throughout the film. And it's really about you seeing it and thinking about yourself. I think it asks questions of the viewer and um, requires you to kind of leave the theater hopefully wanting to see it again to un uncover the meaning or to just like think about, you know, you know, as a woman, maybe you would think about your body's relationship to violence or about the environment and all those different things that come out of it. And I think the, the woods or the forest, and specifically in this film, it's the redwoods, that it, they're a, a metaphor for us at least. Maybe metaphor is not the right word, but we made an analogy. There was a beautiful... Uh, thing that we had read when we were working on the script that talked about how, you know, a writer had written about his love for trees and he talked about how the deepest part of the forest was kind of an analogy for the deepest part of the human uh, kind of unconsciousness or consciousness and that the further we removed ourselves from the forest or from nature, the more that we were removed from our own humanity. And he refers to kind of this mental state as green chaos. and. Laura and I really felt that the deeper, it's kind of a story about looking inward. It's really about self-discovery, I think, transformation. The deeper that she looks inward at herself, it's kind of the deeper that she's at the same time, I feel like, I don't know if, lost, yeah, being lost in the woods, yeah. there's a, the, kind of a parallel happening. Mm. But the woods is really her mental state. You know, so it's not, you know, I say in this film, the logic's defined through her experience, so it's, almost an anti-logic, if that makes sense. Well, I think you've pulled off a very difficult, but almost impossible task in filmmaking as first timers, which is to make a live action feature film about an interior state of mind. Yeah. And, and you, you did it. You know, someone came up to us, we were in Marin County doing a kind of a screening and um, a, a really interesting man came up after, and, and he, he asked us about that. He said, I just, he's, he said, I want to know how you did that. He's, he said, I felt so challenged watching this movie, and I really enjoyed that. And, and I'm so curious as a first-time filmmaker how you pulled doing something like that off, because in a sense, the narrative could go in so many different directions. And I think in wanting to look inward, it's, it is very difficult. And I think a testament to that is what Kirsten had to undergo to become Teresa in this Kirsten film. Kirsten Dunst, who's yeah. this? 
the main character and star of the film. Because we're essentially asking her to convey, I think, some of the, of someone, some of the deepest questions we could have about our, our place in the world, life, death, um, isolation, loss. And she really has to convey it through the smallest kind of detail. And I think through subtleties. And sometimes that shifts in the film. There's a momentum that happens. And I think if someone had said it's, um, our friend Hilton Al said it's like Alice, Alice in Wonderland in reverse. She starts small and gets kind of large toward the end. Yeah. I, I, love, I love what she keeps in the refrigerator. That's one of my favorite details. Uh, and what, it's stocked only with a six pack of beer, a dozen eggs, and a half-eaten cake with icing. <laughs> That's, no one eats in this. Film. No, they don't. <laughs> right? Well, now you know where we, the world. I, I, I was thinking, God, food is food is such you know so symbolic in this film with the eggs, and there are certain things that carry a lot of. I think you can do a lot of great feminist reading with. Um, but the food was really kind of exciting because. Well, my favorite line it's, comes from that. Yeah, actually, there's nothing the whole in the fridge. Movie. When she <laughs> says, "There's, no, there's nothing," in there's the nothing fridge. in the fridge, and I always think, I knew when we, you know, it was one of those things. We had a few takes of it, and you could explain why the audio, it, it, when you see it, it slightly sounds a little like off, which is what makes the line so interesting. Yeah. it's a, it's the, the audio take is different from the visual take. But what I loved about it is when we we did finally, you know, you go through different versions of your film. We were in the editing process, and that scene finally made it in with her saying, there's nothing in the fridge. And I said to our editor, Julia Block, I said, you know what I love about this? I was like, this means so much to me as a woman. I was like, I bet you we're going to get questions when we put it in. Because I felt like when she's saying it, there's nothing in the fr fridge basically means there's, we have no connection in our relationship. She says it to her boyfriend, a person that's kind of a shadow in her life. Um, you don't really ever get to know him in this film. He's a, almost a stranger to her. So I just feel like when she delivers that line, he comes in and says, how was your day? And he drops his like logging kind of work gloves on the table. And then she just looks at, kind of off and says, there's nothing in the fridge. And I just always love that line. And sure enough, as soon as we put it in, we got a few notes from our producers. What's with this line? There's nothing in the fridge. <laughs> Oh, it totally worked for me. <laughs> yeah. but it, was, it is peculiar. Kirsten Dunst plays this character yeah. who gives a totally new meaning to the term killer weed. Yeah. She works in a, is it medicinal marijuana? Yeah. yeah. In a shop. Yeah. A very, a more, that looks more like a nightclub, really, yeah. or the en entrance to a, see, a seedy motel. Yeah. She works for a guy named Keith. Right. Her character's name is Teresa. Yeah. Uh, it, it, their relationship is very elliptical and peculiar. The boyfriend, Nick, he's almost never there. Yeah. I mean, he, she lives with him, and mostly she's alone. And what strikes me about all of these relationships, which are never explained, nobody has a backstory. A, a, right. a, the only backstory is what we get in the very beginning of the film when the Teresa character's mother is dying or appears to be dying. But I, actually, the first time I watched it, I thought they were about to commit double suicide. And when right. I thought it's only the first five minutes of the film <laughs> happening. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it was just creepy. One. It was just creepy. One. What? Yeah, I said just one in the first five minutes. Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, just one suicide in the first five minutes. <laughs> yes, yes. There, I wouldn't have been. See, I didn't actually understand that entirely. It was an assisted suicide. Yeah, yeah. I see. That's what I thought. Yes. And, it, but it's you know you have to kind of go with it. The film moves almost in a way, even though there, it's really shot in this interesting way, both yeah. digital and on film, but in a series of relatively brief scenes, yeah. the scenes unfold almost in real time. Yeah. And without a lot of violins playing in the background, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a soundscape. Right. Uh, but it's uh, not intrusive, and most of it is in silence, which in American filmmaking is rare, right. very rare. <laughs> uh, and I think most audiences would not be, would have to get accustomed to a film right. like this, because yeah. it is so interior and strange and creepy. Um, no, you're right. And, but Kirsten Dunst, 
Kirsten Dunst holds the screen. I know. And, and she seems to understand you and you her. Now, you have a long term friendship, I guess, or a, a even professional relationship with her through your clothing. Right. Yeah. Right? We've known her for years. Yeah, we've known her for 11 years now. And we first wrote this script, started writing it in 2011. And we took it to her and we said, we're going to finish this and we want you to play this role. But we knew in writing it that she's really the only actress that could take on a role like this in a contemporary time because she's, the, she's so natural. And she's, I always think of her as an emotional vessel. And she absorbs people's pain. And she will always say that it's so easy for her. But you know, I literally think she took things from us and put it into this character. And that's how she created, you know, someone that's so sensitive and someone that's so isolated by almost like this burden she carries. And it's a real tightrope act because one of the things that we were, you know, we did kind of decide in making the film was that we didn't want backstories for the characters that come in and out of her life and that we didn't want, we really took the stance, well, if this is her world and we're gonna experience her story through her eyes, if she's disconnected from this man in her life, that's all we want the viewer to feel. If she, she does have a strange elliptical relationship with Keith, as you said, and partly we always felt just because he's one of the only characters in the film that knows something a little bit more about her. Yes. Um, you know, so we kind of played with those ideas, but that's also very difficult to do because naturally when you watch a film or when, you, you know, when you're taking in a story, you become very, you know, it's especially for female on film, <laughs> You know, you want to explain the behavior by the man in her life. Well, okay, maybe she's doing this because her boyfriend's mean to her. Or, you know, you kind of want to use men to de um, define decision making. And we said, well, they're going to be, there's these people that are going to come in and out of her life, but really the decision making is going to be about her process. So in order to do that, I don't think we could have done it without Kirsten. I think it would have been almost impossible because it's really, it's a lot because you just, aren't going to get those types of explanations with a movie like this. I'm really curious about one, well, more than one thing, but I'll start with this okay. one. You have clearly known each other all your lives. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you told me you're only 18 months yeah. apart in age. Yeah. Uh, you work together all the time and have you didn't. You went to school separately, or you went? You both together. went to Berkeley. We yeah. both went to Berkeley and. Kate, so we were separate for a year when Kate was there and I was still in high school. But we and both ended up in the same college. But one of you studied art history? Yeah, that was me. Kate? And English. English. Literature, yeah. Okay, so no, nothing to do with fashion design or filmmaking? No. Uh, and, but you, so how did you start? Did, were you making your own clothes at home? I assume you're wearing your own Well, I know people, right this is actually something of mine. This is, my shoes are. Me too, so partly, part, half, half of what we're wearing is ours. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask which half. <laughs> but, you know, we both started, I made, I made one thing for myself when I was young, because my mom taught us how to sew when we were children, and I made white overalls with red pockets and turtles on them. <laughs> and then I stopped making things, so I didn't make any clothing until I was a designer. We made well, 10 pieces, yeah. What prompted it then? You weren't sitting at well, home cutting out dolls and- You know, life's like, so clothes. weird. I literally, I started college as a biology major. I thought I would be a neuroradiologist. I, I don't know how I got into everything else, so. Well, I do, because I used to see her on the Berkeley <laughs> campus crying, and I would say, she'd just cry and cry and cry, and I said, major. Laura, you'd need a reality check. You're never <laughs> gonna be a neuroscientist. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're going to quit this major, and I remember Elliot Smith was playing a show, and yeah. I said, I'm going to take you to the show in the city, and we're going to watch it, and you're going to get over it and change your major. Moving on. And I did. And it, did. <laughs> it worked. And but, I felt so much happier not having calculus every day. <laughs> but I, I, the problem is I never even got to a biology course. It was just my, the weeder classes they have, like, you know, organic yeah. chemistry. You do all that stuff. But I always knew, I mean, from my early, when people asked me when I was very young, what, what do you want to do? I would always say fashion designer. Mm -hmm. my, my mom says the earliest, she gave us a sketchbook when we were little, and 
you know, she was curious, I guess, a little while after if we had done stuff in it, and she looked through it, and I had drawn all these kind of really, you know, detailed outfits. She thought they were pretty, you know, unusual for my age, and that Laura had gone around our house mapping. Like, she literally made a map of the kitchen. This is where the sugar is kept. And if you know the two of us, in a way, that combination probably feels right. Yeah. Feels right. <laughs> but weirdly enough, I, I you and know. And then I stole her drawings and put my name on them because I was jealous. I could yeah. draw. Yeah. And all her books. And then I stole her furniture from her room. Yeah, I, it was actually I would, like, weird. I would steal everything from her. <laughs> I would come home, and she was young enough where you're like, how did she move dressers and I would come home and walk to my room and everything had been moved out and put in her room. Um, but when we... It's like having a stalker. You know. <laughs> but when we made, um, first started making clothes, we, at a certain point we had both, for whatever reasons, it's so strange because when we were at Berkeley it wasn't, you know, we took one costume design class through the theater department and we both quit it like maybe two weeks into it. I remember they gave us an assignment to do a retelling of a Shakespeare play. Yeah. And for whatever reasons, you know, I just felt like. No, they told, the lady said, she said, you know, you just have to do what the director tells you. Oh, yeah, more and I said, we're not like, doing what? this. I don't even know what a director is. I was like, get me <laughs> yeah. out here. <laughs> we, we, I remember we both, well, that is true. I, when I remember talking to you. Yeah. We said, well, we know one thing. We're going to want to do what we want to do. Yeah. So maybe costume designs not going to be right for us. And then we later on went to, to do costume design Yeah, it's quite, uh, uh, I think probably everyone here already knows you did the costumes for Black Swan, which got quite a lot of attention uh, yeah, and that five was, years ago. So, you know, I don't know what, but it, there was something in us that I think wanted to express, and fashion and clothing was a medium that we both felt we could and I don't know why. It's just we felt like we had something to say through it. And we literally, when we got out of school, went home. And uh, we had these, you know, we made up these crazy assignments for ourselves. We wanted to spend a year learning about horror films because we didn't know anything about the genre. And we had spent all this time studying million, tons of other films because we both did take film, you know, classes yeah. at Berkeley, just mm. not filmmaking classes. And, um, and we wanted to try to make some clothes and literally it was we made our first few you know some dresses and a few coats and they were all inspired by different mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> and we literally someone said to us you should go to New York and at the time we had never been to New York and we didn't know <laughs> that New York Fashion Week was happening and we didn't really understand like I was saying before we didn't understand what New York Fashion Week was but we got on we took this person's advice, and we got yeah. on a plane. We, I'm trying to make a long story short. We got here, and we didn't know what to do. We would, didn't leave my friend's apartment in the East Village. We were crying. We were like, why are we here? <laughs> Laura and I, to us, New York City was a really big city. Just to put it in perspective, we really were like, you know. It, this is before smartphones. So, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> we were calling people on you know, pay, pay phones, phones or... And um, you, you came, let me just make it clear. You came with the clothes that you yeah, were in a just, giant box. Well, first of all, in our in and true our was, style, the was box a, was huge. It was hurricane. way bigger. I mean, a, a blizzard, <laughs> and instead of landing in New York, we had to go to Boston, and then we had to take a train from Boston with this giant box. The of box clothes. was huge. It was huge, and lug it around. And um, my friend was in art conservation school at the time, and always had a new dog she would find in Turkey. So there was dogs all over this apartment in the East Village. And I, I had actually, before we left, had set, sent, um, looked in the back of magazines for different editor names, right? And I had made a bunch of paper dolls that I hand drew with the clothes and sent them in a little arm where he opened. But no, no one got them. So we, I remember one day we just, we, we called, it was like our last day, and we thought, we're really, this is the end. Like, we should have never come here. And we called someone, I don't know what happened, no, someone from Women's Era Daily called us back, right. and we went in, and they they said, come in. Come in, and it was just everyone at the, at the publication. It was Bridget Foley, it was Bobby Queen, and it was about 10 people, um, and they interviewed us, and then two days later, we were on the cover, and they were like, go, you know, go look on the street corner, and that's how it happened, so it was really fast, and it was the first pieces we had ever made in our lives. Wow. That's yeah. big. I mean, it's a great. But then, my favorite part was that 
later, um, Lisa Love, who's a, the West Coast editor, editor of Vogue, read about these people from Pasadena that were in New York. And she set up a meeting with Anna Winter in Los Angeles. And, and when we went into um, meet again in Vogue, we told them all that these, you know, these dresses were inspired by fungal shells. <laughs> and I'll never forget Andre Leon Talley when we said it. <laughs> he laughed so hard. And <laughs> We felt like the craziest people that it may, maybe had ever walked in that that those offices before. So it was fun. Yeah. So but, uh, and Anna Winter became your champion. Yeah. yeah. And you won a CDFA award, and you started showing regularly in right. New oh, York. She, and and she gave us the best advice because you know she's she's really championed us over the years. Um, you know we're a small independent company, so really what you see from us is Laura and I, in terms of it's a lot of heart and soul. Um, we really care about it, it's contained. But Anna, um, when we first met her, when Laura was referring to that story, we wanted to ask her, our big question was, we thought, okay, we have a chance to meet Anna Winter. We don't, we, we don't, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to sell clothes in stores, just nothing. So we, we gotta ask him some advice. We should ask her if we need to move to New York because at that, especially at that time, it was much more unheard of to be kind of in Los Angeles oh, yeah. doing, making very expensive clothes and all that stuff. So we finally, when we met her, we said, we have one question we want to ask you. Do you think we need to move to New York? And she said, no. I can tell what you do is personal. Keep it that way. And that's what we've done the whole time. And in a weird way, it's the most heartfelt advice. And one of the things that's so brilliant about Anna is that she cares about if you understand your creativity and your vision, she'll care about that. I, th mm -hmm. I think if you're wavering in it, then it's not going to be in, in the realm for her. But if you know kind of, she wants you to follow your own voice, whatever that's going to be. But how, I'm very curious to know, it is a personal business and the clothes are all handmade mm -hmm. and, and out of many different fabrics and materials, right. yeah. uh, be beading or sequins or appliques, uh, and it's very intense work. A friend of mine who has some of your clothes said that she thinks, or she's an artist, the, um, the inside is in some ways more interesting than the outside, the whole construction of the garment. But how in the world today, this is couture, how do you sustain a business without a corporate sponsor or some major backing? How do you, and, or a huge distribution across the country or the world? How, how does it keep going? And then how do you have time to make a movie? I mean, <laughs> honestly, that part's you like, know, <laughs> the, anyone that pretends that just because you're creative, that doesn't mean you're a good business mind. I, I always think that's a huge, a huge problem. We've run this company since we started and it's only existing because we're smart about it and we're very careful. Um, and we realized that what we wanted to do with it is to keep it, to keep it insular just so we could protect it and to say that this is our voice and we're kind of like the, the guardians of, of some type of expression. Um, and that's important to us. And I don't know how we made time, looking back on making the film, I don't know how that happened. It was probably really difficult and it was difficult going in, in and out of the collection and going in and out of the process of finishing the film and starting it. But I think it made us better designers. So I, I'm, hmm. you know, I'm torn about it because I know it pushed us creatively. Some, it was, a, I think but emotionally, emotionally it was hard draining. because as Laura was saying, we actually did in the process between, if, if this makes sense, we, when we were in, we went to Humboldt and we did pre-production for a month there, maybe shot for a month, and then we had to come back to Los Angeles and in one month do, do a show. collection and go get on a plane and go to New York, do the show here, do all the sales, and then we went back and went right into editing the film, and then midway through editing, there was another, you know, month and a half break to do the next show, and it's, going between worlds it may it's almost like a it became like a fractured state um but it, it was also at the same time very creatively um invigorating because it almost felt like um in the process for example of editing a film it almost felt 
like an amazing thing to kind of stop midway through, take a break and come back. Uh, so in a way, some things presented itself in a really great way because of our schedule. But I, it is true that I look back at it now and I think, and I remember people, we would say, well, we're actually, you know, working on a film. And I think Laura and I are so quiet about when we do things that I don't think the people around us really understood what we were talking about. So <laughs> I would be like, I'm well, so tired. Like and a month ago, like our trailer came out and people would still, still say to me, oh, I'm so excited about your fashion documentary. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take, let's take a look at the, the, some of the uh, designs from the most recent collection that you showed in Paris uh, over the summer. So you can see, uh, I mean, there is so much going on in everything. Yeah. But are you saying that the two of you are the only ones actually making the clothes? No, no. Oh, we have oh. a team of people, yeah. amazing she people that work on it. Designing. And where is your, do you still work at home? No, we have a <laughs> studio. Thank God. <laughs> um, we, do you share, still share the same home? Yes, we do. But I will tell you this, in our studio, we technically got this, you know, kind of big warehouse to work out of, and we're supposed to have an office that we were going to build in the kind of like top section. And Laura and I still have designed like a few collections in the kitchen space. I know. So there is something leave. about us that we carve out a weird spot that we really shouldn't be occupying and we should have the more professional version, but it just never works for us. So I was thinking the other day, I was like, well, I don't know, we really took over this kitchen area and it's Not probably- so, Like no one has a lunch table. Yeah, <laughs> our whole office Wrong. space is set up in there. Well, you seem to have total immersion in what you're doing, yeah. no matter what it is. Do you, either of you have an independent identity that you can, or do you have an independent life from each no, other I mean, at it's all? A, it's a good question because we're so, I mean, yeah, we, we have an independent life, but we're so intertwined as a creative entity that it's, it's um, you know, I can't imagine creating without her. It's a part of the process that, it would be like, a, you know, trying to play piano and not having a piano. I just, there's something about the way that we, we have a special hidden um, language with each other. I also think we both have a sensitivity to things that, and it could be because of the experiences that we've had from childhood and, and, our, and maybe a collective memory in a sense that makes us want, you know, have the same types of questions that we need answers to and try to flesh certain things out. So in a way, we're very, you know, for most people that, if you know us, most people know us, both of us together, but we do have friends that are separate to each of us. I, I never go to Laura's movie nights with our friend Elliot. She sees every movie in a theater, like, you know, it, there's nothing she doesn't see, and I, I never do that. Because so. he likes to go at 10, he'll call me and say, can you go to a movie? And he's an artist, so he works late. And I'm like, sure, of course. But Kate's like, I'm in bed. Yeah. But I, I, I think, too, it's, Interesting design is something that's really an isolating career. And you hear a lot about how designers have business partners or partners that are really with them. And I, I, I just know that's so important. You, you can see it, you can't do this on your own. So you really have to have someone there to kind of share your, have a dialogue with. And even if it's a designer with their stylist or it's a designer with their business partner or a secondary um, designer, it's, it definitely is a collaborative career, but you know they present it as this singular voice, and it's very difficult to be alone that much. But everyone, when we started to work on the film, you know, we worked on the film with a lot of amazing people. They've worked on many films, and they had said before, I, "Well, I want to know what it's going to be like working with two directors." So I think that that's fairly unusual too. Yes. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I think <laughs> because people were literally saying that they were curious and I knew they had enough experience in film that, you know, they would have a sense of that. And, you know, sure enough, like I remember KK said to us, um, he did the production design on our film and he's worked on amazing movies like um, Marie Antoinette with Kirsten. He also worked on Spike Jones, Her and a bunch of great things. And he said, oh yeah, you guys are like the same person, like the second day of shooting. So in a way it's an intertwined creative partnership and but as Laura was saying, it's, you know, when you're creating, it can be a, a lonely in a sense. So it's nice to have um, people that you can share that with because you have to isolate yourself. Even when we were writing the script, a lot of my friends said, we never see you anymore. And Laura and I 
we're spending, you know, we would work on our collections and then any free time we have, we were writing a script. You know, so it was kind of like, you just end up being in your own world, in your own headspace, I guess. Well, maybe a film certainly is collaborative and you have to work with other people in the business, the other business yeah. that you're in. But when you were writing, you you've done everything together. So, and this character Teresa that Kirsten Dunst plays is really in her head yeah. and in some other dimension. Also, yeah. I, I, either it's the marijuana or the psilocybin didn't actually come up. And yeah. You have this yeah. relationship to mushrooms, yeah. and everyone seems to be floating in this uh, yeah. space. Yeah. And, <laughs> but you know. So from what well of experience did you draw for this to create very, very accurately and with total detail this sense of loss and isolation in this character? You know, it wasn't, we didn't have a similar experience to Teresa, but I, you know, I think we were dealing with our own family things and that came out in the script. And that wasn't the intention. We started, say, we started by saying we want to tell a story about the Redwoods and what they make us feel. Um, there's that great quote by John Steinbeck where he said, no one can capture what these trees are. And then we set out to tell a story where, you know, it's kind of like a creation myth or a rebirth um, of a character that could represent so much about this landscape. And in that, she just told the story for us. It's really strange. I, I even think that it came in stages. It started with Teresa, there was going to be like kind of an undercurrent of the logging. And then, you know, we knew we would be in humble. And then the, the idea of, you know, expansion of the mind with the medical marijuana dispensary kind of fit in. And then all of the stuff just happened as we were writing. Mm. There was no map, you know, we didn't have, Kate and I went to, um, to visit William Faulkner's house one time on a road trip and he had in his bedroom that his wife made him go into, he had made a map on his wall for a fable and there's all the writings of the different days of the week. And I always thought, oh, that's so amazing, but we just kind of, we didn't, we don't work that way. Um, so it just kind of came out as we wrote. Eat, one thing led to another. And I think that was the power of the character because it was more about her feeling things and, and less about um, saying that this was the grand meaning. However, every and everything in the film ends up having a very big meaning. She's no fun at a party, though. No, yeah, that's true. She yeah. smiles yeah. one time. She smiles one time at the party. Let's uh, run the next uh, clip so I'll see a little bit more of what we're talking about. That was a very mysterious <laughs> image. I haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, but this, it's very interesting how you shot this in digitally, sometimes handheld in, uh, on vintage film. You said you didn't yeah. even know if it was going to print. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, it, and off a lot of tight close-ups. I mean, yeah. you, it really creates this inner world, uh, even though we're in this enormous landscape. Right. And, and it does open up. And it's the same with the character Keith, who owns the pot shop, yeah. uh, who's very attractive, and he seems to be smitten with the Kirsten Dunn's character. Uh, uh, 
but he too is in his own world, and yet, yes, they know more about each other than any other two people in the yeah. whole film, but we don't know what that is. Right. So, but it keeps you watching, waiting for the revelation, right. and instead something else happens entirely. And uh, there, there were two lines in the movie that really stood out for me right in the beginning, which was, this won't hurt, which, you know, of course, then you know it's going to hurt a lot. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and that line is repeated yeah, yeah, at yeah. least one other time. Yep, you're right. And the other one is, what have you done, Teresa? Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of what you'd ask yourself, what have I done? But right. she doesn't. She right. doesn't question, she doesn't seem to ask questions of herself. She's not, and, and yet she's just kind of acting out all the time. I feel like for me, the, 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 I don't know, I, I'm trying to think how to formulate what I would say, because I think in a sense that she is, it is an experiential journey with her. So you experience what she's experiencing. And so there isn't necessarily, I guess, the questioning for me is more about the journey. So if, how would you say that? I don't know if I'm saying it right. I kind of think that she's, for me, she questions a lot. Um, but I, I think that it starts at a certain place and then it starts unraveling. Um, I don't want to give away spoilers, so it's hard for me to talk around stuff. But she makes a choice at the beginning that we all think is very empathetic and giving. And what that does, it unlocks something in her. And she starts thinking about who she is as a person. And I think there's a heavy guilt that happens. And that isolation and grief leads to, you know, a series of mistakes and um, another choice. And those things all, for me, come from internal questions. But, um, so I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. answering your question. Well, That's the way I look at, look at that's her. That's a good answer. Okay. That's, that's, let's look at the last clip we have here, which uh, will give a little more, illuminate a little bit more of what this character uh, goes through and what the trajectory is. We have the last clip. This is my That's the most expressive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This and it's character interesting. is in the film. And it's yeah. interesting that you say that because yeah. that was, I think, what Kirsten would say, one of her. That was the hardest, hardest scene, scene she had. He did with her for her emotionally. Yeah. She said, "We, I think we did it," and she, and she said, I, "I can't do this one again." It was interesting because I think it is, you know, it's the idea of an, I think, an internal rage that's happening, which is something, you know, sometimes when. Certain, certain kind of acts of violence or things happen and we don't understand and we want an explanation for them, perhaps we can never get those. So I think it's this internal kind of building of her experience. And in, in that moment, it you know, lets itself out or it starts to build into that. So we have questions from our audience. We can continue talking. Yes. Uh, there's someone with a, um, a microphone here, maybe. You can, uh, people who want to ask questions yeah. maybe can come forward. Uh, while we're getting that together, uh, just, so you were describing having to go back and forth between fashion and filmmaking. Yeah. I don't know why you would do that to yourself. What made you want to, 
Why did you have to make this film? At some, at some point, you, you know, you believe so much in something, and it's so thrill. It's such, such a, making a film is so thrilling. It's a, the most beautiful creative expression I've had, um, uh -huh. the experience of, and it just kind of lit a fire inside me. So it was just like you make it happen. You have to do it. I don't know how to describe it any other way than that. It's really great product placement for your clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did make we did make a few costumes. We, we co co costume design with. Christy Wittenborn, and, and I mean, costume design is a huge job, so, but there were things that we wrote into the script that we really wanted to make specific for mm -hmm. this, and those were like pieces that have, you saw the, that black dress, and if you go into to LA, it's on display at the Arclight, and it, in here, I think two of the costumes are at um, the Angelica Theater downtown, and um, we wanted to do some of the costumes so they had different states so they kind of represented different parts of her as she transforms. So there's a, a slip that her mother owns that transforms from, you know, there's like six different versions of it. And um, it was really exciting to, to make those because they, they have so much meaning to the character. Okay. Um, thank you, first of all, for sharing so much. I'm really curious, um, you mentioned that you spent a year researching horror films before you actually put together your collection, your first collection. And I'm curious what type of research and what your oh. process was like when you prepared to start writing the film in 2011. Well, we, when, you know, I, I should probably use the word research less watching. Yeah, because we <laughs> really just rented tons of movies, yeah. anything from like really campy versions to more serious artistic versions. And we had a, you know, a great um, video store that still exists in, down in South Pasadena, and we also would go to like the Blockbuster. This really cool guy worked there that had made His a name little was Hugo. Yeah, he had a great section of stuff that we would always um, pick from. So we just watched movies obsessively, to be honest. And uh, our first collections that when we started working, you know, had nothing to do with that really. But I don't know. I mean, I think you know, horror is an interesting genre because it's so reflective of sometimes a certain time or space in, in culture. It, it tells you a lot about um, fear. And I think fear is an interesting mm. um, thing to delve into. I think certainly probably one of the things that Laura and I, in wanting to make this film in our own way, you know, whether it's fear about, you know, for us about, you know, the environment and kind of our place in the world and, and the great things that come from human nature and the beauty of that, but also the destruction. I think we have our own fears that come out um, in, in, in our work. So in a weird way, horror films can be as obviously horrific and crazy as you would imagine, but and sometimes I think films that aren't even technically horror films are even scarier. I mean, for me, the underlying threat is just, you know, I think, um, dealing with fear and kind of fleshing that, that out, if that makes sense. Thank you. Do you have a question on this side? Okay. Um, well, thank you, first of all. And second of all, uh, I was really intrigued by how you talk about your environment influencing your work, and especially with your film, you talk about how the Redwoods have always influenced you. Um, and I was curious about how your like, relocation to showing in Paris, how that gives your work new context, and how you feel about that adjustment. It was so exciting to show in Paris. And we've always shown in New York. So New York has been our fashion home since we started. And um, about, I'd say, last December, the, the show venue we'd been showing in for many years, for since like 2008, they were finally shutting down and we weren't allowed to be there anymore. And our show producer, Alex Debatak, said, you know, I really have been saying this to you for years, but I really want you to show in Paris and please consider it. And we had started this collection. The collection we showed in July, we had started. And at that point, it was really elaborate. And Kate and I were like, well, I don't know. I think this is a pretty good opportunity to go farther with our design and to do something more than we feel like we can do in New York. And I do know, and it gave us, I, I think, an interior um, kind of like kickstart to say, it's okay to go further with this and to make it even more um, elaborate than we'd been doing. And it felt really fulfilling. 
And it's also nice because Paris is such a romantic city and people look at fashion there differently. It's just kind of part of the um, artistic landscape of, of, of their world. It's a national art. And that, that sensibility matches the way we treat what we do. Um, so it was really nice, but it, it, I don't have, I mean, I still love New York and I would want to do shows here, so it's so complicated, but I think that it's important for you to try new things for yourself and um, to not just be part of a habit. And fashion design is so complicated and so hard, and I would say that to anyone. I think it's so difficult to do, so if you can make it exciting for yourself, it's worth you know making changes and making things new. Thank you. Well, to, uh, what, I'll read one question that came in on the Facebook okay. page. <laughs> what keeps you from Stacy? What keeps you focused with your projects? How do you overcome feeling discouraged? Oh. Well, that's a good why you have two people. Because if you're feeling pretty bad about something, it's nice to have a partnership where you know you balance each other's emotions a little bit, and that does happen. You know, it's so fashion is one of the careers I would say that has so many highs and lows, and you have to get used to it. It's it's a roller coaster every day, and at this point, I feel pretty comfortable in those emotions and those like extremities. But it's you know, I think it's important to remember why you're making things in the first place. It, we at least fall back on the fact that we make things because we artistically believe in them and they can represent something to us in the long term. And that helps us um, on the way we work. Yeah. Hi, Kate Moore. I don't know if you remember me, but I was actually one of your interns in the summer of 2015. Oh, hi. <laughs> it's nice seeing you both. Nice. Again. Hi. <laughs> One of my questions for, for you two was, I was wondering how you felt like your academic background has influenced your work. Do you feel like by not having a traditional technical fashion or uh, cinematography background that you were, and, and therefore kind of not knowing the rules of those industries, that you were able to be more creative? And then if I could ask a short second question yeah. too, I'm also curious how you've kind of deferred making your brand more commercialized um, throughout your uh, you know, many years in this industry? And, and do you feel like you ever make this kind of uh, decision to balance not becoming more commercialized and maybe foregoing some of those resources over staying true to your artistic vision? It's so funny. I always feel like we're so commercial and then I look at other clothes <laughs> and I go, crazy. what? I know. <laughs> so I, I, it's not by choice. It's just we make the things that you know, if we sit down at a table and we draw something, it's just what naturally comes from us. So that, I think, we're really aware of wanting to keep true to, true to ourselves and to recognize that really there's no place in the industry for people that aren't true to themselves. Um, the people that have a lasting impression, whether they're successful or not, and people know them or not. And it's really about your belief in what you do and that you have your own unique voice and that you aren't other, you know, you're not the person next to you designing, you're yourself and you have your amazing experiences that you can share and all voices and stories are important to be heard and that's really an important kind of way of looking at that. Um, but from our background, our st I know going to school for what we did really affected what, how we work. Um, I know it trained me to analyze things and to find meaning in imagery and to find meaning in in language, and that helps us, you know, formulate narratives, um, whether it's with design or in filmmaking. I always think that, you know, it's interesting because I, I think in the beginning, it's almost like you're timid about it. I feel like, you know, when you say, I don't have a formal education in something, it makes you feel maybe, well, maybe I'm less than someone else. And then I realized that for us, in our process, that, that has been very important because, you know, the flip side is we did have an education. You know, we went to Berkeley and we were studying other things. And I, I do think that very much informed our perspective. And, you know, if I hadn't had those experiences and amazing um, professors that I had there, I don't know if I would have been as analytical as I am and as open as I am to always learning. But something about the way that we work is like a primal thing. Mm -hmm. 
it just comes from the inside and there's not a there's not I don't know and I feel like maybe not having certain kind of construct for that is how we flesh things out in the beginning and eventually evolve so I guess in a way it, it worked for us but everyone's different you know um, you know I know plenty of artists that have gone or creative people that have gone to school and gotten very formal education and you know I know people that haven't so I kind of feel like you have to find your own path maybe thank you so much could you, could you talk about the condors oh yeah we can or do you mean you want us to talk about them or I'm just, I'm just so curious I was at a um a screening of the September issue years ago and oh. Andre talked about that collection that was oh. the, well that's an the important collection I love that collection Sure, I can talk about that because it, it relates, actually it's interesting that you're asking this because I can give you a film example of it and a fashion. <laughs> so the fashion context of it, probably what you're referring to is we did a collection right before we went. In fact, a lot of what we did on that con, we did a collection inspired kind of by the California condors. We had this, you know, we had been in Death Valley and we wanted, for whatever reasons, we were very, we grew up being obsessed with the condors, which are these incredible birds that have, like, I think, a nine feet wingspan, and they're um, just amazing. And they were on the brink of extinction, and as kids, you know, you would give your milk money to try to save them. And I think at a certain point, there was only seven left in the wild. Now they have, I think, around 300, which is a miracle, because they're these ancient, incredible birds. And Laura and I did a collection inspired by them, and that collection was right before we went to go work on Black Swan, and I often say that the work that we did in Black Swan really started there because some of the same materials we took and used, and really for us, I think the swan was more of the condor in our mind yeah. when we worked on it. But moving into doing the film, you know, we had done something where we had been able to um, help with a little bit of... Uh, you know, kind of a donation to help the condors, and they had, right when we were getting ready to go shoot, um, someone called us and said, you know, if you want, there's a special um, condor that you could, you know, see, because a lot of the ones that have to LA Zoo, they can't, humans can't see them because they don't want human imprinting, and they're really trying to get these birds to come back in the wild. But there's one named Dolly that actually, I don't think can ever go back in the wild because of an injury that she had. And um, I said to Laura, I really think we should take Kirsten to go and meet this bird because so much of her character is about this internal kind of evolution and struggle. And, uh, and in a sense, this film's exploring the fragility of life. And I felt like it was interesting to experience a world where there's a few people on this planet that wake up every day and their life's mission is to save this bird and yet the rest of the world goes on and knows nothing about it. And I'm talking about people that are climbing up in redwoods, have to go in the nest, you know, stay with the babies, take the babies back out, put them back in in case they, you know, Trap. all this stuff to try to save them. And I just felt like there was something so fascinating about that, to care so much about this life or death kind of, you know, if this bird goes away, then it's gone forever. And, and I was so interested in that because it's so emotional. And we all actually did go and um, got the opportunity to kind of meet this incredible bird. And truly for all three of us, it was like an out-of-body experience. I mean, it literally felt like you were meeting something that was, I mean, it felt so much wiser than we yeah, were. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, so so I guess we love the California condor as the summary to all those stories. <laughs> what if, uh, I, I should ask, I, I have inspiring more questions. Uh, another one, uh, Jennifer from Facebook. What do you, I mean through Facebook, what do you think are the differences between the East and West Coast fashion industries? Oh. That's a good question. Oh. Well, it's hard because I guess in a way we were a comp. We were I think that there's an East Coast fashion industry and the West Coast fashion industry is not as high fashion. It's just different. But it, it had that, and it comes, you know, West Coast kind of, I feel it comes from a history of costume design from Hollywood, um, and then you had amazing designers like Galanos and Rudy Genrich and, you know, Bob Mackie, people that were working on the West Coast, and it was very okay. elaborate, and things that, you know, um, competed with Parisian couture. And then 
on the east? I don't know the answer to this. It's all, for me, it's like why we wanted to be in LA. It just felt right. So I think it's supportive of you know, both landscapes. Fashion should be wherever it can be. I guess we've run out of time. So. Can we take no time for the last question? Yeah, let's ask the last question. Yeah. Um, I guess the well, one thing I wanted to say, I really appreciate how you have this um, oh. compliment. Thank you. <laughs> we coordinated that yeah. for you. <laughs> I think the unique identity and the compliment, and I obviously how you are too as sisters and humans. But um, I guess watching you watch the clips of your film and inspired me to be curious about what it's like for you to do your work. Obviously, you've seen, you've probably seen your film several times. Yeah. interesting. Well, you know, it's a different process because fashion, it's like you make and you make and you make and then you have your show. And it's a live experience and there's no going back. So it's one time and things can go wrong on the runway and um, trust me, they can go wrong. And uh, <laughs> we've had experiences where our shoes showed up, they're the wrong color, we had to spray paint them. We did a whole collection that was all marbled and it was based on Frankenstein and the shoes were like white and they needed to be gray. They were these boots. And backstage, like the models were in like these crazy boots that had to be laced up. It took two people to put the shoes on. And then they had to be painted. And right they went out on the runway <laughs> painted. So it's like, and Those people, are, oh, sorry, I was that's the, the thrill of it. It's like a lot, it's like theater. Um, and filmmaking, it's theater when you're shooting, but then you get to spend time really thinking about your decisions and critiquing it. So, this lets, you know, one allows you to be a little bit more perfectionistic in what you're doing. And fashion design, I don't even think you know what you've made until the lineup backstage. And I always say the, the most thrilling part of a show over six months for us is when we're backstage and everyone's dressed. And you're like, oh, that's what we did for six months. Because you don't know until it's like pieces are here and they're there and, you know, all your ideas are scattered. So it's, um, yeah. Well, I think you've done pretty well bringing them together. <laughs> Thank you. The film Wood Shock, an actual yeah. syndrome, I gather, yeah. Yeah. some psychological state not to do with mushrooms. <laughs> uh, the film opens in New York this Friday and in Los Angeles next week. Uh, I wish you all success, Thank and you. I will welcome you back into the art world next year when you have a show at the Washington. Yeah, that's right. I forgot.